morning. My name is Nick, this is Otto. This is the Tierra Permaculture Vlog. It has just started to sprinkle on us. So that's a good start to the vlog, I guess. Hey bud. Someone reached out to me yesterday and asked about Moringa, so I wanted to feature that real quick. And I also just want to show a little bit about how we, what we're feeding the chickens and, and uh, how we keep them fed with uh, minimal feed. So let's get started. Cat wants to go back inside because it's raining. Can't handle the rain, bud. It won't be long. It's going to be a sprinkle. All right, so the chickens are making a pretty big ruckus this morning. Not sure why. Feed the chickens a lot of things. One of which is old, very moldy bread. Wow. I don't even know if they'll eat that. Woo. And the rest, food scraps. They love food scraps. And you can see in here, let's get a little closer to you. You can see here I have eggshells. I try to crush these up because if you don't crush them up, they might start eating their own eggs. So that's one thing. It's good to just crush them up as you throw them in. But if you don't, it's not that huge of a deal. They love pineapple. We got some, this is just uh, onion peel, but they won't probably eat this, but they'll mix it in into the uh, organic material down here. It'll turn into compost. You can see once I come in here with the food scraps, they're very interested. They want to see what's going on. They want to know what I got for them. Uh, celery, the bottoms of celery that we're not using. Want that? You can have it later. Pretty much any food scraps that you have, they'll eat. And if they don't eat and you have a deep bedding system, they'll scratch it in and it'll end up turning into uh, more soil or more compost. So I also do give them a grain feed or a pelleted feed that's made of grain and such. But, they tend to be more interested in any for, sort of the food scraps rather than the actual the feed I give them just because they want real food just like us you know if you're given you know say Oreos and chips versus a, a full like five course meal of actual food you know you're probably gonna choose that five course meal now I'm not saying food scraps are a five course meal I mean that's a little ridiculous right but it's to them, they're getting real food, you know? I mean, it's sure it's the stuff that we're not gonna eat, like the edges of the pineapple. Yeah, sure, I could scrape out all that fruit with my, with my teeth and everything, but if I think about it as my food scraps aren't waste material, they're a feed material, it's much easier to then be like, oh, you know what, I'll just, I'll leave a little extra for them, you know? I don't need to work as hard to get every single ounce of food because anything left over is gonna go to my chicken, so it's not gonna go to waste. So we do that, and as always, I use weeds, quote unquote weeds, what's a weed? A, pl a plant where you don't want it, right? But I do use lots of weeds for uh, feed here as well, so that definitely supplements my, my feed bill. Basically, you need about a quarter pound of feed a day uh, if you're feeding chickens, uh, but if you're also supplementing that with other things, that it needs kind of less than that, so. The cats over here interested in what I'm doing in the chicken pen. If you guys have been following my vlog for this week, you've been hearing me say over and over again, well, it's about to rain a lot, so I gotta prep. Oh, it's about to rain a lot, I gotta prep. It's supposedly actually gonna rain a lot now. Between now and two days from now, it, our area is being called two to three inches. So quite a bit of rain coming. So now I actually do have to prep for rain. So um, that is something I'm gonna be looking at today as we're walking through the vlog, uh, as I talk about the couple other things. Looking at down here, I'm noticing, you can see there's a decent amount of bare soil, and as always, this is right along the fence line. This is where they walk the most. So I do wanna make sure before that heavy rain that I come here and I, and I cover this up, and I'll probably end up doing that today. All right, so one of you guys asked about the Moringa tree, and you can see right here, the Moringa flowers and the leaves here. So Moringa is a very kind of small leafed, kind of almost dainty leafed tree. So I have it growing right here and it was actually growing here before my mom actually planted it. This whole trunk right here, this one here, isn't really completely one that I'm gonna be planning on keeping. 
because this seems to be a much stronger main trunk and I don't necessarily want two main trunks coming off of the base here. That can cause instability in your trees here. So knowing that this is gonna be my primary leader, I look at this now and this branch coming up here, I also don't necessarily want because it's not gonna be the strongest branch. But for now it's just fine because it's actually reaching over the pen here. You can see how, if I back up, all these branches are coming this way. They're searching for light over here. And well, I certainly don't want that long-term because that's just gonna cause this in a major storm, that's just gonna crack and fall and cause damage, right? But for now, when we don't have these major storms coming, it's actually just providing this little bit of shade, a little bit of dainty shade over my chickens. So it's giving them a little bit of extra shade in the middle of the day there. Of course, I do have this shade cloth and I do have the tarp down there to help with that too. But this tree just helps modulate the heat in the middle of the day and it's right above them. So while they are gonna have, I mean, also it's just like, it's a beautiful tree. That thing's beautiful. So it does also give a yield of beauty, this Moringa tree. But Moringa is a, is a powerhouse, especially in the tropics. You can just shove a, shove a branch in the ground uh, if you're in the wet tropics and it'll likely grow. Um, it'll likely grow new roots. I did that a few times actually. I was trying to establish my chicken, uh, chicken pen fence line with uh, Moringa posts. I just cut, when I cut these back or pruned them back, I just shoved them in the ground, but the chickens ate the leaves too fast for me to actually get them to survive because if you keep eating all their leaves, if they keep taking their leaves away, plants are gonna die because they can't actually photosynthesize. But back to the actual leaves here or the flowers and leaves. So these flower buds, these are edible. You can eat those. The leaves here, these are all edible. These are actually really high in protein, the leaves. So it's actually a pretty good feed too. The chickens actually do like them. They don't like them as much as necessarily some other things. So let's see if we can get them to eat some. Want some? Yeah. Well, she had one. Chickens, well, we got one, one eating, but these things, they're, they're absolutely edible. I'll prove it to you just by eating some right in front of you. Very rude, I'll talk while I eat. But they have almost a nutty flavor. Not quite nutty. The, when they get to be this age, like fully fully grown, they're small still, but they're still they're fully grown. When they get to be that age, it's not as it's not as good to eat. Uh, it's not as delicious to eat, I should say. It's so good to eat. But when you get the uh, let's see, if you get these nice new fresh ones right there see those those ones that's what you're looking for if you're trying to eat good to tasty ones really tender not really hard at all it's really easy to chew super soft and you can kind of just taste the nutrition so it's called moringa it's also called horse ra horse radish tree i think it's is one of its common names um because it does have a slightly spicy flavor to it I really like spicy food, so I don't really taste the spice at all. Um, but people do tell me it does have a spicy food. And if I eat enough of it, I start to kind of taste that. But it's not like spicy in terms of like, it call, it's called horseradish tree. It has like a similar taste, but I'd say it's like horseradish toned down very far. Turn that knob way down. And that's, that's kind of the, the spicy level. It's not anywhere close to a horseradish where you're smelling it and getting it near you. And you're like, woo, that is spicy. You know, it's not like that. Or at least some, some of you probably don't think horseradish is spicy. Good on you. But so my system here, I'm using this tree mainly as just, you know, another, another tree, another, another tree to attract uh, bees. The bees love the flowers. The bees come all over this tree. They'll be flying around, especially the big bees, the uh, like bumblebees, but I don't know actually what they're called here. Um, they're big and black and they fly around. They love it here. I also see honeybees on this tree. This tree serves as a perch for countless birds. I've probably seen at least 15, 20 species of bird in this tree throughout the various times, eating, eating the leaves, eating the flowers, uh, eating, just perching on there. Uh, it's a great tree just to have in your garden to, you know, attract to wildlife that they love it here. They love this tree. So it's really a multifunctional tree and pretty much every part of the tree is edible. If you guys haven't heard of it, there's a website called plants for a future, pfaf.org, I believe it is. And it's a really great resource for free online information on plants and their uses, edible uses, medicinal uses. Uh, sometimes they include the lumber uses in there. 
And it's a really great resource just to find a little bit more about a tree, its uses, and it actually gives you kind of documented case uses if there are any available. it would be like, oh yeah, this was used here for these kind of things. And so some of it might be kind of more conjecture and you might want to think about whether or not you want to take that to be true, but most of it is backed up and they have references. So check on that. Really great resource. Um, but yeah, I love this tree. It's a beautiful tree. It's super, it just grows abundantly. Uh, it actually grows really well in our climate here in this kind of tropical rainforest climate. I don't have to do much to make this thing grow. It just does its own thing. Um, all parts of it are edible, even including like apparently the, the inner bark apparently is also edible. I have not personally tried that, so do your research. But the, I use the leaves and the flowers very frequently in salads, um, great in salads. So yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of what I use it for. There's, mo there's many more uses for Moringa, uh, countless, countless uses for Moringa. Uh, one of the, the most common ones is you actually take the leaves and you dry them down and then turn it into a powder and that becomes a nutritional additive to foods, especially smoothies. People use it in smoothies a lot. You can also make tea, tea out of the leaves. There's Moringa tea is pretty common. So there's so many uses. Personally, I like to just eat it fresh. And you can see here that it can actually take a pretty, pretty regular cutting so this, this branch right here, you're kind of seeing through the sun, dappled sun here, but you can see here it kind of snapped off because I keep harvesting from right here because it's hanging over my garden. So I walk in there on my little stepping stone and come up here and pick and you see these are all really fresh green. These are not the old ones yet. They're still kind of that lighter green versus the more uh, heavy green of the older leaves over here. So this lighter green leaves, it's, these are the really good ones. So I just keep cutting them right where I can harvest them really easily and they keep growing back. And then that keeps giving me a, a constant supply of nice, fresh, lovely to eat Moringa leaves. So that's why I let it grow. See how it's, it's kind of growing straight out right over into my garden here. And I let that happen because it's easier for me to harvest. And then I can, I can eat it more. I could and should cut these branches back at some point, but until it becomes a problem, I'm just gonna let it be. Yeah, this, this, tree is, this tree is an abundance of life. It, it gives life, it gives nutrient to, to sustain life. I, right now, I just quickly counted, I see like six or seven lizards on there running up and down, fighting each other for the territory. That tree, life-giving and life-supporting. So definitely, uh, definitely recommend it if you're in a tropical climate. And I think if you're in the subtropics, it works just fine. You might even be able to get into a temperate climate if you can bring it into, inside uh, in the wintertime. I think it's it's more of a tropical tree though, so it doesn't need that heat and not freezing. That's my understanding. But like I said, you might be able to you might be able to swing it in the subtropics just fine, and maybe even to the temperate climate. Well, you know, do that research. Look at that page, Plants for a Future. It does give the hardiness zones of all those trees, or at least the reported hardiness zones. So you can you can take a look there. I need to add a little mulch, so I'm going to leave you with the chickens for a minute while I do that. It's as simple as that, guys. These are actually all uh, banana leaves or banana family leaves that I harvested the other day when I was putting on this uh, deep, deep mulch layer in my garden here. So I basically cut all the leaves off to use as mulch at the future, and now I'm using it as mulch. So you can see they're always interested. Anytime I bring in fresh fresh greens or some sort of mulch, they're already always interested because they think there might be something hiding underneath it. This is also why there's always bare patches of soil because they like to go through here, find what they can, scratch through it, and they end up moving it along. Otto, I don't know if you want to come in here. The rooster will probably have some words about that. Good boy. So yeah, just like that, that's, some, that's enough of a Enough of a blanket of material there to protect that little spot for this heavy rain. I'll probably come out before we actually get that heavy rain. If, if we get that heavy rain, like I said, they've been saying that we're supposed to have heavy rain for weeks, but I do think it's actually here now, or it will be here starting tonight, tomorrow, maybe. Um, by the way, if, if they do come, those heavy rains, I'm going to come outside when it's pouring um, and kind of film the water flows across the property, just to kind of give you an idea of how I'm designing for those water flows. Um, when I actually already have a video about that, I'll link that above um, a couple videos. One of when I actually went out and uh, showed you a little bit of rain, but it wasn't like a downpour, it was just 
some, a good amount of rain that started to get a little bit of overflow. So I'm hoping we get like a very, very heavy couple inch of rain event so I can actually show you the major water flows that will happen here. Um, so you can understand how you really need to think about water as one of your primary design kind of limitations or stre or positives. It doesn't have to be a limitation, but it does have to be something you always have to think about. Water is always going to be entering and moving through your property. You need to know how it's doing that and you need to either work with it or manage it in a way that's beneficial to your land uh, while not affecting anything negatively, not causing any sort of erosion or anything like that. Ilo giving a, himself a nice little scratch on this loose piece of chicken wire. He loves rubbing up against metal, sharp metal things we've noticed. Whatever kind of sharp metal thing, or even pineapple, he loves the pineapple, top of pineapples. He just, he'll actually like eat, he'll like put his mouth on there and then like scratch himself with it. And then it's, he's pretty funny. So in preparation for the heavy rain, I'm just, I'm always, I'm always looking for bare soil. I'm always looking for somewhere where we might get some sort of erosive flow of soil that will cause damage to my property. So let's look, I'm just gonna take a quick look through each of my beds. This one, pretty good, especially here because I had a nice deep layer of mulch over here. Could maybe use a little bit more, but I've added mulch to this probably for the past week on a regular basis. So it should be just fine for this event. Over here, I had this nice deep uh, mulchy layer here, uh, right along the seed lines of arugula. So you can see all the arugula is popping up in between that bulky mulch. And what's the nice thing about this bulky mulch is it's gonna protect from all that harsh sun from the west, cause this is, the sun comes in this way from the west and it's really intense. And it's also gonna protect from those heavy raindrops. So while they might get hit a couple times while, they're, while it's raining, this big, mulch is going to protect the soil from actually getting compacted from all that rain. I do have mulch in my pathway here. That's something I like to try to do if I haven't. I always want my pathways mulch, but sometimes I steal the mulch from the pathway to use in the garden. Uh, that's, that tends to be what I do, especially with this heavy stuff like uh, palm, palm frond leaves. This takes a long time to break down because of the high silica content. So I'll put it in the pathway first and walk on it for a while. And then once it starts really breaking down, then I'll use it as mulch. So that's, uh, I do want to make sure that I do have that, and I do. Looking into this garden, everything seems just fine here. Plenty of mulch down here. So look, this, we did the exact same thing with that heavy mulch. We put that in, see how it starts to disintegrate, and all these big pieces you see in here, these were the same exact size as the ones here. And see how these are really round and structured and and everything these ones are almost flat at this point this is this one was just as big as that one over there and it's pretty much flat this one was the biggest one i put in here and you can see it starts rotting down but right underneath that right underneath this piece here you see the soil it's just it's super happy there's a lot of life right there you can see all those little critters rolling around and uh this is really nice soil and it's protecting the soil so for these plants here because i want these plants to survive looks like these zinnias are probably about to start flowering that's pretty exciting very excited to see how they look here how they're doing i still have this is my one my one calendula plant that is taken from here from seed i do have a couple more in the greenhouse that will be coming up soon hopefully but yeah so far, everything's actually looking pretty good. I'm pretty happy with my preparedness for this upcoming rain, and uh, hopefully that remains the same. So the beans here are all dying back, but the, the zucchini is really starting to take off. This is the one that's always been the most healthy, but look at the ones up here, guys, the ones that were really sad before. These guys are really starting to take off. I'm really excited about it. Very happy that they're finally kind of coming to fruition. Starts here, zucchini starts, just about ready to transplant. They're starting to get that first true leaf. If we were having like a, a small amount of rain or a regular size amount of rain, I'd probably plant them out because, but because I know it's gonna be potentially really heavy rain, I'm gonna, I'm gonna wait until after the rain comes and then I'll plant them. Just because I don't want to uh, 
I don't want them to get so stressed immediately after transplanting by having like a huge dump of rain on them, really heavy rain falling on them. So otherwise I would plant them out now because once I see that first true leaf on there, I know it's time for them to get out into the wild. All right, greenhouse watered. And here in the tropics or really anywhere we get super, really hot in the middle of the day, you probably know this already, but it's good to make sure you have venting in your greenhouse. Uh, here, I just leave the door open because that's going to be, that's the easiest for me just to leave that wide open and allow all that venting to go through. But if you can't open your greenhouse completely, at least having some sort of venting is going to prevent it from overheating in there and really stressing out those little babies. You can see as usual, right at the base of the chicken pen, chickens are here waiting to want to get out. Um, that's not going to happen right now, but right here. This is where they kick, this is the bottom of their pen where I have their compost pile area. Well, right now it's more of a flattened compost slash topsoil area. Um, but they still scratch through here and you can see right down here, they really kick all this up and this is all just excess kind of compost here. So they're kind of building up my little, my area here, but I don't necessarily want that right here. So I actually harvest from here pretty frequently to use on my garden because this is all stuff that they've pre-screened for me. But Knowing there's rain coming, I want to make sure I at least have a little bit of protecting on there. That's the same thing I'm doing with this leaf. It's still here from last week when I was doing this pro process, prepping for rain. Um, still right there, so ready. Down here, these guys are all fine. They don't need any help from me. The uh, plantains, they're loving it. I'm thinking I might come harvest this guy because I think he's just about ready to harvest. I don't think they actually turn fully uh, yellow here when they're ripe. This is the calabasa, the local pumpkin. Uh, I think usually I see them either green or with a little bit of yellow on them. So I think it's time to come down and harvest him or her. I think it's a him because I think I saw other male flowers on here, but I don't know. I, I was confused about that because I thought only the females produced, but then I heard that some there's a male, there can also be male fruits. So I'm still learning all this guys. So the other day, I had some leftover uh, string trimmer or trimmer line for your for a string trimmer or weed whacker or whatever you call it in your area. I always get I always get flack for calling it a string trimmer, but it's not string necessarily. But whatever you would call this stuff, this is the resource I had. So usually I'd use you know, like a baling baling string or just twine or something like that, but I couldn't find any of that. So I used my uh, this this trimmer line so this is a really thick trimmer line and it's actually working really well I just basically put it in a spiral up so it kind of slowly got higher and higher and then my cucumbers now have something to grow up on and I think it's actually gonna work really well because this stuff's really tough I mean this stuff cuts through grass and everything so grass and weeds so hey Otto what are you up to can you go up on your chair it's probably gonna be wet You want to play? You want to play? You're dirty. Your feet are dirty. Your feet are very dirty. You need to wash. But back to this. Sorry for the distraction. Uh, this stuff's really tough. So I think it's actually a play, do really well as a uh, trellis for these cucumbers. And these cucumbers are doing very well. I'm very happy with them. I'm super excited to see uh, if they actually produced into full fruition it really looks like it all but this plant right here all these are actually second generation on this property so we grew it from seed it's a dark cucumber i believe i got it from uh, i think this one was from baker's creek either baker's creek or seed savers exchange those tend to be my two go-to seed sources um, but i think this one was from baker's creek and or rareseeds.com and the first one we did it actually gave really nice fruits but it, it it really quickly right when it was doing great it just died and so i didn't know if that was you know there could have been a pest problem in the soil because i was still developing everything it was one of the first uh one of my first garden beds here so i didn't have really high quality compost yet or anything like that so um it might have just died but i also had it next to tomatoes and apparently those two things do not go well together and that's something i'm learning so that might have been the problem too. So we'll kind of see what the actual problem was, but I'm growing these cucumbers up this kind of TP trellis here 
uh, basically to save space. So instead of having to trellis it, like, you know, up, have a long row of them and then trellis upwards, I'm actually gonna try to have these guys just come up straight up onto this trellis here. And this trellis is just made of bamboo pieces I found on the side of the road, uh, a long branch that fell off of a tree on the side of the road, and this palm frond, which I got right here on the property from this powerhouse of an organic matter producer up here. Amazing tree coconuts. But these guys are doing really well. Really excited to see how they're doing. But you can see he's already, he's, his ten, tendrils already grabbing on and, uh, or her tendril. Hopefully it's a her and a he. Very happy. I do have a char, a shard, chard, chard. I don't remember. I never know how to say that word. There's one right in the middle here. I'm probably going to have to transplant it because it's going to want full sun. But I thought that I might be able to let it start here and kind of get going because so far I haven't, had, I haven't had chard really work well here. So I was thinking maybe if I let it get going underneath here as the cucumbers come up, then they might protect it and that, those beginning stages. Then I can trim off the bottom leaves of the cucumber and it might still get enough sun to be happy uh, and have a little bit of protection from that heat sun here in the tropics because chard usually grows you know, up north in the temperate climates. Oh, look at all these... Uh, flowers on this watermelon very excited about this this plant actually turned yellow at one point and seemed like it may not make it but it's now pumping out flowers like crazy so i'm pretty hopeful that we're gonna have a nice little harvest here oh look at that we got our first little bush beans coming up right here those were seeded four or five days ago something like that there's another one down here that is not covered up i'm just gonna give them a little bit of mulch cover so you can Try to find his way up. There's another one coming up right here. I also see this area with cilantro seeds from our property. I'm actually seeing a little bit of bare soil here, but I'm actually okay with that right here because uh, one, this this uh, cucumber or cucumber, this watermelon will hopefully come over and kind of give me some protection. But two, I do have pretty new seeds in here. So anytime I have really new seeds, I don't want a huge, heavy, heavy layer of mulch because then they'll have a little bit of a hard time getting up and through that. Um, so I usually tend to do like a semi, a little bit less of a, of a mulch when they're brand new seeds. Um, and then once I see them seeding, then I do a nice heavy mulch around them. That kind of gives them a chance to get up, get started uh, without too much hassle, um, without too much work behind them. And then once they're actually established, then I protect all around them and then they really start pumping. I put this on uh, Instagram and Facebook, but yesterday I was harvesting grass to add, add some extra mulch. And uh, he was helping me by, every time I threw a grass piece there, he would put his paw on top of it. And I threw another grass piece, he'd put his paw on top. And then I just, I did that probably for a good 10, 15 minutes. And he was just sitting there, keep on, he thinking I was playing, I was throwing him something he wanted to catch it and catch it but really he was holding on to all the mulch I was harvesting pretty funny pretty funny to watch all right guys that's it for me today hope you enjoyed that I tried to focus a little bit on that moringa tree as requested by one of you guys and uh, adds a little bit of mulch just talked about using our food scraps in the, in the garden a little bit and then obviously as usual giving a little garden update and things I'm doing here so if you do like what I'm doing please like and subscribe to the channel it really helps me get more reach and, and have a little motivation to keep going and uh and we're, we're prepping for heavy days and hope, heavy rain days, and hopefully I'll be able to give you some, some, uh, some updates on that as, we, as it starts pouring. I really hope it does start pouring so I can really show you what I mean by the heavy water flows we'll have across this site. And so you can start understanding that a little bit better. So yeah, I hope you all have a good day. I hope you have a good week. Uh, happy Memorial Day yesterday. I didn't actually say yesterday, but happy Memorial Day in, in retroactively. And uh, until next time, have a good one.